Okay, good morning, everyone, and uh, good afternoon to those who may be joining us from, from Europe. Uh, I am Mark Shevsky. I'm the director of Harvard Center for Hellenic Studies, and it's my pleasure to welcome everyone here today to our um, event uh, entitled Today's Thucydides, Power, Politics, and Appropriation. This will be a roundtable uh, discussion um, featuring um, a number of, of experts and um, stimulated um, really by the uh, book, uh, Thucydides in the Age of Extremes, that has just uh, come out um, uh, under the uh, editorial direction of our current spring uh, fellow, uh, Ivan Matiasic, um, and um, also uh, Luca Iori of the University of, of Parma. Um, this book is um, an open um, access uh, book uh, published in the History of Classical Scholarship uh, Journal, so it's available online for you to, um, to read um, if, you, um, if you wish. So we will be talking about um, the power, uh, politics, and appropriation, the use of Thucydides in modern politics, in international relations theory, and I'm always struck by, by the fact that um, the reception of Thucydides is perhaps um, a more vital uh, question, or at least as vital a question as the reception of any classical author, uh, precisely because Thucydides and his authority seems to be invoked quite uh, casually in debates about actual international policy uh, today. Uh, when we need only to think about this notion of the Thucydides trap, um, which has so uh, dominated the discussion of the United States policy towards China and the interaction between China and the United States, we need only to think of that to realize um, how significant uh, the understanding of Thucydides can be for the modern world. And the speakers today and, and the book that I uh, mentioned explore uh, various aspects um, of um, this phenomenon, particularly uh, with relation to the 20th century. But in any case, um, I'm not going to um, say anything further other than that uh, very brief introduction. I'll pass things over to uh, Dr. Carolyn Stark, who is our uh, Associate Director of Academic Affairs. And Carolyn will will introduce um, each of the members of the panel uh, to us. So Carolyn, please. Thank you, Thank you Mark. Um, so our, our first um, panelist is Christian Vent and is professor of ancient history at the Ruhr Universität Bochum. And he is the founder of the Berlin Thucydides Center in 2013. His main research interests revolve around ancient historiography, Thucydides and the reception of his work and sea power in antiquity. Um, our next speaker is Rachel Bruzzoni, is assistant and professor at Bilkent University in Ankara, Turkey, and currently a fellow at the Center for Hellenic Studies. Her work focuses on literary aspects of Thucydides' representation of the Peloponnesian War, and she's currently working on a commentary on Thucydides' Book Three. Sergio um, Brillante is postdoctoral fellow at the Sorbonne Université in Paris. He works on Greek and Latin manuscripts, ancient geographical texts, and the reception of the Greco-Roman past in the 20th century. His second book, titled Anche la, la e Roma, Antico e Antichristi, nel colon <laughs> colonialismo italiano, is coming out this summer. Luca Iori is assistant professor of ancient Greek history at the University of Parma. His research interests focus on the reception of ancient historiography in modern and contemporary history, with particular emphasis on the reception of Thucydides and the political thought of Thomas Hobbes. Um, he is working in preparing the edition of Hobbes' translation of Thucydides for the Clarendon edition. Um, so Ivan Matiyash is assistant professor of ancient Greek history at Kafoskari University of Venice and is the current fellow at the Center for Hellenic Studies. His work, he works on Greek historiography, ancient geography, and the history of classical scholarship in the 20th century. He is currently preparing a book on the Thucydidean studies of the British classical scholar and politician, John Enoch Powell, in collaboration with Tim Rood and Daniel Sutton. Federico Santangelo is professor of ancient history at the University of Newcastle. He works on the political and intellectual history of the Roman Republic, on Roman religion, and on various aspects of the history of classical scholarship. 
Together with Lorenzo Cavalli, he is the editor of the journal History of Classical Scholarship. And Lorenzo will be joining a little bit later, but I'll go ahead and introduce him. Lorenzo Cavelli is Associate Professor of Roman History at Ca Foscari University of Venice. His main research interests focus on ancient history and Latin epigraphy, with particular emphasis on the relationship of the Venetic and Adriatic regions with Rome between the late Republic and the late Antique period. So those introductions out of the way, I'll turn it over to Christian. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Can you hear me just the question to, to make sure? Fine, thank you. So dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for inviting me to take part in this beautiful event that to me serves at least three purposes. It is meant to create a platform on which we can discuss the Cidadean reception and what has been done with or sometimes better to his work in so many perspectives. Scholarship has opened up many new doors in this regard, be it explanations how the potential conflicts of our world are likely to happen, or just the invented quotes of Thucydides in movies like Wonder Woman. Most tastes will be served when dealing with the afterlife of this famous text, and it is, at least to me, continuously surprising in how many regards it seems to emerge and matter. But more precisely, this gathering turns around the volume Ivan and Luca edited in 2022, entitled Thucydides in the Age of Extremes and Beyond, Academia and Politics. I think it is more than appropriate if I, as the first speaker today, congratulate you to this major success and the illuminating contribution this collection makes to contextualizing Thucydides and reception mainly in the 20th century. I do not want to recapitulate the content of its chapters, but instead highlight some recurring motives and reflect about the general theme of Thucydides and extremes. Before I do this, I think it was a beautiful and appropriate decision of yours to dedicate the volume to the memory of Peter Rose, who was not only an eminent scholar and a fascinatingly erudite interpreter of Thucydides. He reminds us in his concluding remarks how inviting and how dangerous at the same time it is to engage with Thucydides with a concrete purpose. To use this work as an adequate analogy for other eras and political constellations requires prudence and skepticism two ingredients of analysis that are quite often put aside. I think that those who had the privilege to meet Peter, to discuss with and learn from him, will not forget what an impressive and towering figure he was and his politeness and balance could not conceal that he had strong opinions about the ancient world as he has shown us in so many perspectives he took on. His death, is a great loss to the academic world and he will be remembered as one of the truly greats. But there is a third purpose of this round table and perhaps the most important of all, the occasion to make the cities better known and in this vein interesting to a larger academic audience, engaging in discussions that evaluate its importance to our world and its tradition. We all hope that our proceedings may hint at the essence of the Thucydidean writing and make people engage with its complexity and its intellectual wealth. I think that the volume we are talking about today does just that, as have some of its predecessors. And this is a highly welcome contribution. Why could Thucydides have been a model that is perfectly adaptable to a world of extremes? It seems that it has been read and used primarily in times of despair, in situations where old certainties collapsed and civilizations faced dramatic changes. The most famous interpretations are closely linked to developments and events that were recognized as potentially all destructive and abysmal cataclysms that turned structures and perceptions upside down 
and triggered new ways of reflecting about the state of the world and the own place in it. This is why, apart from his prominence among historians in the late 18th and the whole 19th century, Thucydides became more and more prominent in 20th century discourses about the functioning of world politics. As, for example, Benjamin earlier has shown in his work, he was always around when commentators of imperial behavior and statesmanship searched for given examples fit to enhance the authority of their analysis. In this regard, not much has changed over the centuries. But it is the density of impacts throughout the 20th century that has made many people hoping for explanations and formulae how to deal with the challenges of their time turn to Thucydidean wisdom as if it was a sort of political vademecum. The technicized warfare of World War I with its nature of attrition and the seemingly senseless death of millions had rather traumatic repercussions in public culture and with intellectuals. And some of them made Thucydides the perfect witness for their own feelings about the greatest event that had just happened to a great part of mankind. Some even emphasized the close parallel between the conflict the world had just witnessed and the so-called Peloponnesian War, using Thucydides as a guide to understanding what had happened. And by this, claiming implicitly that Thucydides had been right to foresee that something similar might happen again due to human nature. This meant that two massive wars could have followed rules or structural laws that Thucydides had discovered, applicable to the phenomenon of war itself, and therefore considered as a paradigm for interpolitical conflict and its dangers. IR theory soon took this path and made him the forefather of their discipline, very comparable to what the so-called science of history had done before. It was in fact the perception of extremes that had propelled this process of embracing Thucydides as a universal model. This, as we all know, did not end with the Second World War with all its atrocities, breaches of civilization, and even bigger dimensions in everything it encompassed. The explanation that in fact, both great wars formed an entity and were simply interrupted by a fragile and badly accepted peace treaty, as proposed, for example, by Winston Churchill, was modeled after the great analysis from the Athenian author who dismissed the Treaty of Nicias in 421 as never able or even meant to stop the ongoing war. Enoch Powell had already hinted at this possibility in between the two world wars using Thucydides as Ivan Matiasic's chapter reminds us. The world that had suffered these catastrophes turned to Thucydides again to help it explain how the new world order was to be understood after the total breakdown of order. The Cold War offered a new field of analogies that interpreters, analysts and prognostics tied to Thucydidean thinking, creating and questioning some axioms that supposedly influenced or even guided the realm of international politics. And so made them open to prognostic analysis and control. It seemed as if the interest in re-establishing control resulted in a tentative approach to a text that promised to provide clarity and truth to those who really wanted to see it, a strong asset in times of problems perceived as existential. Eric Hobsbawm's attempt to categorize periods via their main characteristics led to some catchy labels like age of imperialism or age of extremes. I cannot possibly comment on this, but it is not far-fetched to say that the 20th century saw a high point in the general perception of crisis and danger, as well as the consequent development of extremes.
as if the concept of oxysis was taken from Thucydides' archaeology, the means for wealth and welfare, for medical treatment and educational progress, developed as fast as the potentials of mass destruction, genocide, environmental collapse, and complete extinction, with the apocalyptic nuclear threat at its forefront. The strive to find ways to cope with the feeling of global insecurity and possible extreme consequences materialized in attempts to find orientation and universal truth in great past thought that appeared to explicitly offer the possibility for analogy. Lucas and Ivan's volume encapsulates this great kinesis. And it is fascinating to see how most of the examples treated in there are reactions to a perception of the necessity to deal with extremes. Simon's work, for example, is highly embedded in the dealing with the trauma of World War I, and Tim Rood shows it in his detailed presentation. Hartwig Frisch, as emphasized by Hans Kopp, pondered about the best behavior of a smaller power when confronted with a situation like the Melians in 416 on the basis of the infamous Melian dialogue and used it as a tool to dismiss interstate propaganda. The problem how to react on the challenge of fascism could be addressed by citing passages from Thucydides and let them do their work with allegoric power. And a claim for rationality in face of rising irrationalism seemed to have been Cochrane's approach for Thucydides in 1929. From a military point of view, Laurent claims that the Sicilian expedition has become a handy and constant paradigm for addressing military disasters as extreme events. Let me conclude my short intervention with two remarks. To me, as a scholar in the field, it is great to see that the reception of Thucydides still constitutes an attractive field of study, because I'm convinced we have only begun to grasp why this text was so intensely used in so many ways. This enables us to better understand what it is that makes its content and messages so special. The broad horizon displayed in the chapters proves that the attempts to overcome disciplinary boundaries have been fruitful and can be promising for times to come. But, and this is where Peter Rhodes' skepticism comes into play, what is highly important in this regard is our common interest in not only contextualizing the different dealings with the famous text, but in grasping their inadequacies and misconceptions as well. As the much talked about Thucydides trap by Graham Allison with all its resonance in the media and the world of politics has shown, the Athenian author has never lost his power and his text still functions as a boost of authority and presumed learned insight like only few others. We will not dwell on the question why this is so today, but we should keep observing how our own desire to cope with extremes and specifically extreme danger makes us more willing to accept that an ancient text can offer answers and guidance even to our own present. The seductive potential in this thought has driven many academics and politicians towards appropriations of Thucydides that not even acknowledged its complexity and difficulty. Ivan pointed at this in his chapter as well. So I think it is time for a less hopeful approach to Thucydian thinking and a little more reluctance to view it as a concrete analogy open for simple use. Hope, as we have heard somewhere, boasts a comfort of danger, but often does not leave any place for future caution. And it is this feeling of uncertainty, of openness and curiosity that we should nourish when we are confronted with Thucydides. In this regard, it is mandatory to see clearly through famous and influential receptions and their contexts. 
for future interpretations could resemble or reflect them in the course of human or academic or political things. Your volume, dear Ivan and Luca, helps us all to do so. Thank you very much. Rachel, would you like to take over? Sure, sure. Um, thank you for bringing us all together. Can Can you hear me? Everything's okay with the sounds? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, thank you for bringing us all together and for um, publishing this fantastic book, which I think is very important. I would like to begin by talking, um, as Christian did, about this problem of the Thucydides trap, which I will borrow Christian's words and say is it's inviting and dangerous, and it has this kind of seductive potential to treat Thucydides text like it is giving us easy answers, which I worry about um, in terms of Thucydidean reception. We're now in another era that feels like a time of crisis, and people tend to look to Thucydides for kind of presenting us with these types of solutions. So just for an example, a few weeks ago, I was at a conference with not just academics, but with um, people who are involved in politics, and they were talking about the Thucydides trap as if it's some sort of, you know, proven, demonstrated, this is the way things work, and there's no getting around it, so we may as well embrace war with China um, sort of issue, which I do think is overly simplistic, and it's not what Thucydides is for, and um, is something that we should be thinking about too, because we have a responsibility here. So what I really enjoyed about this volume is that it's tackling the fundamental question of how is Thucydides uh, tema SIA? How, what, what is Thucydides for? What is the text supposed to do for us? which I think is a huge question. And that seems to change in different historical periods. I think Thucydides, well, that, that's one thing that was very clear in this volume, that in different times, people saw him as representing very different political viewpoints than I would say that my interpretation would be today. Um, and this problem of historical causation, how, how is he representing historical processes? How do these events take place? He is grappling with issues of responsibility, causation, and guilt in the same way that somebody like Sophocles in Oedipus is also grappling with these issues. Um, so I think that's that's a very important question that I was happy to see uh, addressed in the book. Um, one of the things that I found most kind of alarming in the volume, which I was not aware of, was the extent to which Thucydides had been used um, I, Powell talks about this to make Pericles look like Hitler. <laughs> um, that's that's a that's a really that's a scary thing. And I would like, as professionals, to make sure that that kind of thing cannot happen again. But I would be interested to hear how my fellow panelists, you know, feel that that kind of question could be addressed. I also thought it was really um, an important point, which I had not seen addressed often before, that this reading of Thucydides is quite, tends to be quite selective. And I don't mean that as a criticism. The Luca and Yvonne pointed out that um, 
the same passages keep coming up over and over and over again when people are interpreting Thucydides. And they kind of address this question of whether are we putting too much emphasis on those passages and are we not spending enough time with it's a gigantic work with the rest of it. Um, so I think I think that was also a really important um, point that that I had not seen made before. Um, and I again would be fascinated to hear what everybody else thinks of it. Um, something like the Melian dialogue gets a huge amount of airplay, but the, that's that's a tiny part of the work. Um, one, just a couple of additional points. I I really appreciate the emphasis on not siloing Thucydides into different academic fields that it's not very healthy in interpreting Thucydides to say, you know, this is the international relations approach to him. This is the literary approach to him. This is a historical approach to him. And we treat them all separately. And I think that is something that this volume has made a lot of progress towards uniting that these things should be treated together because Thucydides treated them together. Um, and he's, his text is something that I think is very easy to approach in such a way that you see your own values mirrored in it. And maybe many texts are that way, but especially Thucydides, I think. So I think it's important to appreciate and work together with all of the fields that consider Thucydides um, fundamental. Um, so I, I found this a fascinating text, um, especially the unpublished remarks with Powell, I thought were really wonderful and interesting and problematic. Um, and so uh, I very much appreciate that you guys have done this work and inviting us all here today. And that's what I've got. Thank you, Rachel. Um, Sergio? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I guess you, you can hear me. Yeah. Thank you very much for this invitation. And um, during this uh, short conversation, I will try to show other potential uh, research axes in the large field of the reception of two cities. My goal will be to show the importance of the volume edited by Ivan and Luca that will be uh, for sure fundamental for other researchers on the same topic. I would like to start from the cover image of the volume. It is a striking picture that hits the reader, but I think it gives us a clue to the main theme of the book. Looking at the famous image and at the human figure depicted in it, we actually recognize two different characters. Depending on the observer or on the moment in which we look at it, we may see Charlie Chaplin, of course, or Adolf Hitler in it. The same goes for Thucydides in the 20th century, um, who, as is now demonstrated by the always innovative essays collected in the volume, can be the anti-imperialist, the Machiavellian political thinker, the eulogist of democracy, or at the same time, the sympathetic observer of the oligarchic experiment of 411. He can be the Marxist historian of Artwig Frisch uh, and the Saint Croix, of course, but also the pragmatic and realist historian of Powell, the anti fascist of Gobetti, and at the same time, the anti democratic of Perabino. This duality of Thucydides' interpretations. Um, is, of course, conditioned by the very content uh, of the work, which is based on certain fundamental dichotomies. Hegemonic big cities and allied small cities, external war and civil war, both themes that not surprisingly recur in many of the interventions collected here, alongside another interesting opposition between central and peripheral wars, and I'm thinking here in particular of Francis Laurent's uh, intervention on the expedition to Sicily. 
And of course, Thucydides' text is then the first major Greek work to deal entirely with one war, that is with a binary relation that involved two forces that represent two different but equally present value systems in European and US cultural history, Athens and Sparta. And in the 20th century, Thucydides could therefore only be first and foremost the starting point for reflecting on the wartime events that upset the world order of the time. Indeed, it is precisely from the reflection on World War I and World War II that Thucydides really stands out as a classic in various countries at the same time, thus realizing the intuition of the Greek historian himself, who not only spoke of his work as an acquisition for eternity, but also knew that the events he described would be constantly repeated over time because of the invariability of human nature, as has already been said. Commenting precisely on this statement in the first book of Thucydides' work, Arnold Gom, the great commentator of Thucydides' uh, history, could not fail to include a note concerning recent events within his historical commentary of 1945, and he wrote, and I quote, the events of the last 25 years in Europe only proved that Thucydides' hopes for his history were to be fulfilled much more completely than even he ever expected. This sense of the correspondence between the situation described by Thucydides and the situation experienced between the 1930s and 1940s was also grasped on the eve of World War II by a French historian of antiquity who was very attenti attentive to current political events, uh, such as Henri Marou. The scholar of Augustine of Hippo and of education in antiquity was also an active personality in French Catholic and democratic organizations in the 1930s. He contributed in particular to the journal Esprit, uh, discussing various political issues and focusing mostly on political situation of Italy, where he lived and observed the increasing power of fascist government. In his most famous paper that appeared in the journal Esprit in 1939, called Tristesse de l'Historien, so sadness of the historian, Maru deals with the role of historians and history within contemporary society. Among other things, he mentions yeah. two cities as well, and he defined him the historian who made the Peloponnesian War the most intelligible of all ages, since every war is found in it. Reading Thucydides, Maru realizes that the situation described by the Athenian historian in the first book presents various similarities with that experienced by the Europe of his own time. Through the Peloponnesian War, Maru was able to understand the present and understand the position to be taken in that present. It is not through a simplistic analogy of Athens or Sparta on one side and some modern state on the other that this result was to be achieved. In Maru's eyes, the greatness of Thucydides consists in presenting both fields at the same time. Only looking at contemporary, only looking contemporary at the Athenians and at the Spartans, the modern reader could really understand that historical event and figure out how to act in his own time. Um, he, he wrote, and I quote, now I was on the side of Athens and now on the side of Sparta, democratic as the first one, anti-imperialist as the other one. More than the, sample, the, the simple dichotomy is the complementarity of the positions represented by Thucydides that matter for the French historian, who after the Nazification of France declined, declined the offer to become professor at the University of Sorbonne in Paris and joined the resistance in the south of the country. This possibility of interpreting the present in the light of Greek history will continue into the years of the world, uh, of the world uh, war II. The analogy, as was evident as well from the words of Gom previously quoted, is reinforced by the dynamics of military events. As the Greek historian perceived the Peloponnesian War as a single event lasted for 30 years, some modern readers of Thucydides spread the idea of a single global war in the first half of the 20th century, divided into several phases and lasting since uh, 1914. 
A prominent Italian historian, Adolfo Omodeo, in late 1945 wrote, we are now coming out of a 30-year Peloponnesian War. Omodeo was not actually a Thucydidean scholar. He was primarily an expert in the field of history of Christianity and on the history of the Italian Risorgimento, but Greek history was one of his, of his interests. Notoriously opposed to fascism, Omodeo is a key figure with regard to the reception of Thucydides in Italy, since the first 20th century Italian translation of the Greek work was published in 1942, thanks precisely to, to him. The translator was actually uh, Pietro Sgroi, but the work was in fact commissioned by Omodeo himself in order to figure among other titles of a collection of classics of historiography published for the Institute of Italian Political Science directed by Omodeo. The editorial context, the collection of an Institute of Political Studies, makes evident the kind of reading of the work, which is common to many other countries and people, as is indicated in several essays uh, collected in the volume, such as that by Tim Rood, Benjamin Early, and Virgilio Ilari. Partly because of the concomitants of this work, Omodeo focused on to see this history in, uh, during the 40s, and it is no coincidence that his only article dealing with classical Greek history concerns precisely the Athenian historian. In this paper, in his paper titled The Idea of Civilization in Thucydides, La Concezione della Civiltà in Thucydide, the author starts from, from an appreciation of the work for its sophistic character. Indeed, Omodeo rightly pointed out that the ancient sophistic could be much better reconstructed from this work than from the scarce fragments attributed to the sophists, properly speaking. This aspect in particular allowed the Greek historian to emphasize the importance of the law of the strongest uh, beyond all hypocrisy. The, the, the writing, Omodeo's writing, is from 1941 when the failure of international communities was evident to everyone. Mussolini's show of force had triggered the Ethiopian War in 1935 and demonstrated the weakness of the League of Nations, which allowed Italy to invade the territory of another member state of the same Congress. By 1938, the Munich Agreement legitimized Hitler's unilateral occupation of the Sudetenland and the invasion of Poland the following year was thus part of a framework of great fragility in international relations. Thucydides is thus praised by Omodeo for the way he depicts those relations. But at the same time, the Italian historian also makes a criticism of his predecessor, namely attacked his failure to grasp the repercussion on the civic, on the civic community of the unscrupulous Athenian attitude in the field of foreign policy. According to Amodeo, Thucydides failed because he did not sow the connection between Pericles' exaltation of the decree of civilization achieved by the school of Hellas and the bitter observation of the spread of civil wars that we read in the third book of his work. Sure, wars and, wars and submission of other cities gave rise to the empire and allowed Athens to become the center of the Greek world, but at the same time, this education in violence and those habits of prevarication destroyed the polis internally, giving rise to factions engaged in an endless and self-destructing struggle. Each political group acting in the polis tried to prevail over the other by breaking the constraints imposed by the democratic system. The stases, the civil wars, says Omodeo, are described by Thucydides as a disease, as a pathology, but, uh, and I quote, he did not realize that this condition which he highly deplored is nothing but the repercussion into the internal life of the city of the unrestrained crudity of foreign policy. War, which was regarded as a normal function of the state, was actually a revolution that results, the results of which escaped every human control, end of quotes. Omodeo's attempt was thus to unify this dichotomy of Thucydides' history 
that we mentioned at the beginning, and this intellectual operation led him to acknowledge the failure of civilization. Athenian history, as narrated by Thucydides, became in his view the symbol of cultural crisis that had been at the center of European intellectual reflection in the first half of the 20th century, a period which saw an enormous development in various intellectual fields, from history to psychoanalysis, and uh, this, uh, this development had for outcome uh, only a fratricidal war destined to end in a nuclear disaster. What was then the point of, uh, of culture? What the role of humanities? Asked Omodeo. And this is just one of the many questions led by the reading of Thucydides, of Thucydides during the short 20th century. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sergio. Um, Luca? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, excellent. So I take the floor very briefly to thank, first of all, the Center for Hellenic Studies for hosting this amazing roundtable and for the interest shown in our edited volume. And uh, I warmly thank the previous speakers for the way they introduced our two cities in the age of extremes and beyond. They were extremely generous with us, but displayed also a special keenness, I think, in understanding the purpose, the real purpose of our collective effort. I hope you will forgive me if I deal again in my talk with this project, but I think that our experience as editors may be relevant for the topics here discussed. In particular, I will illustrate how very briefly, of course, how we have tried to tackle in an original way the great theme at the center of our meeting. I mean the political reception of the cities in the last hundred years. First, um, and I, I know that I can speak also on behalf of Heaven, we have tried to adopt a, a broader and more complex perspective than previous studies. But how exactly? Um, as you know, most scholars has so far focused on the impressive fortune of Thucydides in contemporary America, mainly in the field of global politics, strategic studies, and international relations. As we mentioned earlier, this real veneration of the Greek historian was born in the climate of the Cold War, was consolidated on new ideological basis after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and still today forges heuristic categories to interpret geopolitics. I'm thinking, of course, in particular, of the controversial tag of Thucydides' trap. Well, in our opinion, scholars have confined their research almost exclusively, or too much anyway, to these topics, often neglecting some earlier and crucial readings, especially in interwar Europe, France, Italy, Germany, UK, which reveal instead much broader entanglements between the afterlife of two cities and modern politics. Conversely, the minority of scholars who have so far actually examined these earlier readings, consider for instance, the excellent collection Ombre de Thucydide, have not attempted to organically connect these earlier interpretations of the Greek source to the most recent trends in the Thucydidean reception, especially in the US. In short, um, Ivan and I think that a general overview of the Western political afterlife of the cities throughout the 20th and 21st centuries has long been lacking. Our collective volume is the first attempt, if I'm not mistaken, to provide or try to provide such an overview, even if the breadth of the chronological span considered as necessarily imposed a selective treatment of the subject, as you may see from the table of, of contents. In providing this kind of general overview, we have also tried to identify some distinguishing traits of the series reception in this period. Our idea is that one of these traits, probably one of the most relevant, can be found in the ideologization of the ancient souls. By this term, ideologization, I mean, we do not simply refer to politically oriented readings, but to the fact that many interpreters try to organically integrate the worldview of Thucydides and the political lessons his work conveys 
within the opposing ideologies that shaped the history of the 20th century, namely fascism, Nazism, liberal democracy, reformist socialism, and communism. And it is precisely the frequent interplay between Thucydides and these contrasting ideologies that led us to evoke in the title of our volume the famous historiographical category of Age of Extremes, coined in 1994 by Eric Hobsbawm to define the past century. Well, in adopting this label, we align ourselves with Hobsbawm's interpretation of the 20th century as an age of ideologies which played a decisive role in triggering the great historical processes over the last hundred years. And to further reinforce this connection with Hobsbawm's work, we have also chosen, as of course Sergio uh, recalled, uh, to put an iconic frame taken from the classic movie The Great Dictator by Charlie Chaplin, released in 1940, on the front cover of our book. But this image has a second purpose for us. As you all know, in this movie, Chaplin impersonates Adenoid Hinkel, dictator of Tomania, caustically mocking at Hitler and the tragic rise of European fascism. Thus, this frame recalls one of the central topics of our volume, the aberrant reinterpretations quoted precisely by Rachel of the cities proposed in Nazi Germany, but also in fascist Italy. As a young English scholar wrote in 1936 with a certain degree of ironic disgust, quote, as the most striking figures of Caesar and Augustus had already been captured as prototypes of Mussolini, Hitler might still be made to look very like Pericles, or Pericles rather to look like Hitler." Unquote. The young scholar was Johnny of Powell. Anyway, it would be a mistake in our opinion to think that the relationship between Thucydides and the 20th century ideologies only resulted in vulgar deformations of the ancient souls. Such were the most superficial and grotesque appropriations. In fact, this relationship is declined in a much more complex, nuanced and articulated manner involving interactions with different academic disciplines. Classical scholarship, of course, history and social sciences, such as international relations, sociology, anthropology, and geography, as Timothy Rood well explains in his engaging chapter. This is the reason why we decided not to confine our analysis to the re analysis, sorry, to the reuse of the cities in a purely political key but also to investigate wider issues concerning the history of classical scholarship and the process of consolidation of the social sciences in the academic systems. And our analysis does not fail to reflect even on today's growing divide between the academic study of the cities in the spheres, respectively, of classics, political science, and strategic disciplines. It is on these grounds that the interplay between academia and politics is the thread that connects our collective effort. Due to time constraints, I cannot go into much detail. Uh, I only wish to reiterate to conclude that this interaction between academia and politics should not be understood as a dialectic of separate spaces but rather as a continuous osmosis between realities that are structurally interconnected. This kind of intersection emerges from the range, for example, of the media conveying the readings of the series presented in this volume. They include not only specialist publications, often of high standing, but embrace also a very broad range of texts directed at rather heterogeneous audiences, newspapers and periodicals, political magazines, educational materials, public speeches. The same entanglement between academic and political milieus emerges if we examine the biographies of many of the protagonists of these chapters. Some like Johnny Nock Powell, embarked initially on an academic career and then devoted themselves full-time to politics. Others, like Hartfried Frisch, pursued both activities. Most never abandoned their primary vocation for scholarship, but nonetheless worked for state-funded bodies, 
That is the case, for example, with Alfred Zimmern, Gaetano de Sanctis, and many US historians and political scientists who worked for the top echelons of the American administration, a name for all, Donald Kagan. Looking to the future, uh, and I conclude, uh, a broader and more systematic investigation to these types of sources and personal histories, quite like uh, Sergio did, is hence to be hoped for, as it would allow for a deeper examination of the crucial structural osmosis between academia and politics that have shaped the reception of two cities in the 20th and early 21st centuries. But now I must stop, uh, and I don't want to take too much of your time, but before closing, uh, let me thank each contributor to this volume. Uh, I see here some of them. If our book has, so to say, its own soul and coherence, this is largely due to the enthusiastic, real enthusiastic dedication with which every author joined our project. And among them, I'm particularly pleased to recall the late Peter J. Rhodes, who gifted us with one of his last pieces before his sad passing occurred on 27 October 2021. And this is the reason why we dedicate this book to his memory. But now I really hand over the floor to my friend Ivan, who will continue our conversation. And thank you all for your attention. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the Center for Hellenic Studies for hosting this event. Thank you also to, especially to those who have spoken before me and for accepting our invitation so eagerly and so enthusiastically. Um, here is an image of uh, the kind of work we've done and uh, the archival work as well. And uh, just quickly to show you what this is. This is, of course, the La Revoluzione Liberale, Piero Gobetti's journal. Um, from 18 November 1924. Then you have Hartwig Frisch and his obituary on the New York Times in 1950. Below the La in Liberale is the first page of Powell's um, frequently quoted today, The War and Its Aftermath in the Influence of Antisidian Studies. And below that, there is a letter by uh, Zimmern to uh, Gilbert Murray saying how Thucydides is taught unintelligently in schools. Uh, and he, but how he also is very fond of him, and on uh, and then the lectures of Thucydides uh, by the same Zimmern, uh, if I recall correctly, 1905. And this is the piece uh, that um, has been written by Tim Rood and discussed who, who discussed Zimmern and Thucydides. Um, now, in a classic article published in 1967, uh, Rainer Koselleck reconstructed the long history of Cicero's phrase. Historia Magistra Vitae. And the piece opens actually with an anecdote from uh, on the, on an anecdote on the use of Thucydides as a fake example of monetary policy, uh, which was offered to the Prussian cabinet in uh, 1811. And uh, this is also this anecdote features on the first page uh, of Catherine Harlow's and Neville Morley's book, Thucydides and the Modern World. Now, Koselek in his piece showed how the modern idea of progress has had been replaced, uh, had replaced, sorry, the long-standing view of the cyclic history. After the early 19th century, the, the past seems to be a kind of reservoir of uh, exemplar. And there is an opposition here, Koselek noted that already, between this exemplarity of history in the phrase of Cicero uh, and the reception of Thucydides. Um, however, in recent times, the Athenian historian uh, has indeed become a go-to for explaining several compelling events uh, or even instructing political leaders around the globe. And we have, uh, I have collected here a number of newspaper articles uh, published in the last couple of years. So we have, of course, Alison's to see this threat, which had been mentioned already, but also during COVID, uh, to see this and, and his Pericles have been recalled frequently. Uh, and then the war on uh, um, the war in Ukraine as well, Million Dial, but also other episodes from the history uh, of the Peloponnesian War. And I believe that maybe a repository of this public use of Thucydides would be useful for kind of future research on reception of Thucydides in contemporary debates. Now, according to Siegfried, Siegfried Krakauer, 
uh, a historian is like an exile or a stranger, a figure, he says, of extraterritoriality. Uh, books like Hobsbawm's Age of Extremes eventually take auto autobiographical forms because the historian is deeply involved in the events he's narrating. Uh, the difficulty here is to take a distance from the subject. And the same works also for Thucydides, of course, he was a contemporary of the events he was describing. On the contrary, for us dealing with the history of the Peloponnesian War or the Greco-Roman antiquity in general, um, this means studying a kind of foreign country from a uh, anthropological perspective. But when we deal with uh, the reception of Thucydides, these two perspectives of foreignness and of proximity overlap. And I'll try to expand a little bit on these two concepts um, in also um, attempting to summarize some ideas for future research that Luke and I have discussed in the last few months. So moving uh, from a kind of Western perspective on Thucydides, I would be interested to see what, what, is, uh, what was going on, for example, in the USSR or in the Eastern uh, Soviet bloc in general in, uh, during the Cold War, uh, but also in non-aligned countries such as Yugoslavia, because of course, there, there are, there, I'm sure there are Marxist readings of Thucydides in those countries during the 20th century. Uh, but had to see that this had any impact on international relations theory uh, in those countries before, before or after 1989? I am not sure, and this is kind of uh, something that I would like to investigate or, uh, um, or study further. And if we move from, uh, uh, from uh, the Soviet bloc, from the USSR, from Russia, further east, and uh, we can have a look, we can look at China, and China uh, has often looked West for both inspiration, but also uh, to use the Western values and approaches to various fields of knowledge as a critique. Um, I know of an, uh, of an example in this, um, on the Chinese use of the past. Uh, for example, uh, the Chinese scholars are currently preparing the first Chinese civil law code based on the corpus Iuris civilis or Justinian from so a, a work from the 6th century AD. Uh, so there is a, a strong connection actually between uh, China today and the classical past. And to see that this here plays an important role um, in China and uh, between China and the West, and the West uh, but also in uh, contrast to uh, the, uh, the ancient world. Now, a very recent article uh, that you can see here by Wang Yang discusses the cities in China. And this is, as far as I know, the first piece in English or in any kind of Western language that actually uh, studies and uh, uh, discusses all the different ways in which the cities has been used in China in the last hundred years. Um, and he starts by recalling how German historiography, actually the beginning of the 20th century, influence very much Chinese historians. Um, and here an appreciation of Thucydides scientific, so to speak, approach was thus already embedded in the work of Chinese historians. The first translation of Thucydides uh, in 1960 by C.A. Feng was based actually on Rex Wagner's Penguin translation. So on the English text, not on the Greek. There is here a parallel, of course, uh, with Western translation of Thucydides, uh, Lorenzo Valla's translation of uh, 1452 was then the basis of the first, not only of the first French translation, but also uh, of the first English translation by Thomas Nichols. And we have to wait only uh, for Thomas Hobbes to write actually to publish the translation based on the Greek original in 1629. In, in the introduction, as I can, I, I found out only through Huang, uh, Huang Yang's uh, article, in the introduction to his translation, um, the translator actually shows how strong um, his Marxist views were, and this is of course 1960, so this is nothing, nothing weird. He focuses on economic factors, he talks about slavery, uh, criticizes Thucydides for failing to focus on ordinary people, and accuses him of being a bourgeois historian. Um, and actually, uh, I reading this piece, I recall that also Zimmern, as, um, as Tim Rood wrote, um, writes in his piece, made similar complaints in a 1905 lecture, saying that Thucydides, and I quote here, does not care for the persona mute of the whole drama of his book, the women, the children, and the slaves. And I don't suppose we can call Simon a Marxist. Um, recent decades have seen a, a surge of publications on Thucydides in China. This is again evident to me only from this piece. 
due to my ignorance of the language. And uh, reaction, the reaction that uh, Alison's book on Thucydides um, have displayed are only a little fraction of actually of the Chinese engagement with the Athenian historian. And it seems evident that there are many more perspectives to be explored with the assistance probably uh, possibly of specialists in Chinese history and literature. And this would be, I think, interesting to, uh, to examine in depth, uh, both from a linguistic and philological perspective and from a historiographical and political viewpoint. So I have started from a public to cities in newspaper articles and in media, um, moving on to the East in the, during the Cold War and the Soviet bloc, and uh, uh, then uh, to a critique of the cities for not being Marxist enough and often too bourgeois according to Chinese historians of the 60s and the 70s. And to conclude, uh, what Luke and I would like to kind of propose and uh, thus open also up the discussion um, is a sort of global Thucydides, one that goes beyond the boundaries of Western literature, political thought and scholarship and engages with different cultures from Eastern Europe to China, from South America to uh, South Africa uh, or the African continent in general. A Thucydides that is, that is thus both distant, detached from our own experiences and at the same time kind of familiar. And uh, I conclude with a last image uh, that I find very amusing uh, from uh, the early days of the pandemic with Pericles being disinfected uh, <laughs> from his, uh, from, from Western approaches, perhaps. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so we'll open the floor to the panelists to respond to each other. And those of you in the room, if you please remember to talk into the microphone so everyone can hear. Thank you. Okay, so I'll, since nobody's willing to start, uh, <laughs> I'll uh, kick off with a um, with one one thing that uh, I mean, uh, every one of you, those who spoke before me, um, you made very appropriate and interesting remarks. I was only struck uh, positively and in a way very sympathetic with what Rachel said about being um, kind of careful in uh, in the in our approaches to to CDDs and also to political. Um, to politics in con in the contemporary world and how this and how he has been used and misused mainly uh, in so many different fields and uh, Rachel you were talking about meeting people and they uh, not classicists I suppose saying that the Thucydides threat is something that is kind of already there even if for classicists it's definitely not uh, I mean there are many issues with that book uh, by Alison and I was uh, wondering whether you have a kind of answer to how one could proceed in making uh, our research and our thoughts more uh, perhaps intelligible to a wider audience, because we usually tend to um, deal with complex issues in a complex way, as is, and as 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 everyone everybody here agreed, I suppose. Whereas in a political contest. Uh, then you have to really simplify things in order to make them intelligible. So do you have any thoughts on that? And then I see Christian as well, maybe would uh, like to say something about it. Yeah, I don't have a good solution. I, I think that as Thucydides scholars, we should try to engage with things like popular media more than we do, um, which is something that works like you know, the Thucydides trap did try to engage with. So I think I think we should be conscious of how outward facing our work is, and we should make efforts to um, to address these questions that say, you know, sometimes people try to say there there are very easy solutions. Thucydides says this will happen, and he's he's magical, so it will for sure happen. Um, that's that's my best answer. Hopefully, Christian has a better one. <laughs> no, not don't don't have a better one uh, at hand, and and hadn't that hadn't ever a better one, but um, 
what I find find most interesting when I well, it's not so often the case, but when I do it with, for example, teachers, school kids and so and talk with them about something from facilities which they perhaps don't even know that it is from facilities because they don't have a major clue about what facilities may be um, or who it may be. I think what what is to me what is most striking is the question is to to discuss the question with people who are not mainly engaged with let's say classical scholarship or even antiquity um, is the question why they are prone or open to constructing an, a, a kind of authority around Thucydides or around other classical wisdom, let's say, or presumed classical wisdom, uh, that perhaps is not even interesting to them normally. So why is it possible to choose, for example, Thucydides with this, uh, well, let's say, massive legacy of, 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 of uh, creating authority out of it um, and then use it with people who have never made heard about it or perhaps heard very little bits of it and still related to something that is impressive authoritative whatever and this is very i find that very interesting if you discuss it with children for example so school children and ask them why they find it um why they couldn't just say, well, this is complete rubbish, for example. This is not not interesting at all. And this this is sometimes quite illuminating to me because you, you hear voices that are normally too shy to do this. And then they, they can they can think what they can grasp of it, perhaps even what they can make out of it, if they see that it is intelligently done, that it's a very interesting material in itself without knowing anything about the context. And this is something that I that I find quite interesting. And this is something that I find quite interesting in, in this uh, Thucydides trap business, uh, because um, the mo most part of the of the um, uh, of the of the reviews and of the reactions I have seen in the political field, in the field of political academia as well, does not criticize the thing in itself. But it is, they, they crit mainly criticize the question if it is applicable to uh, modern day, the modern, the modern world, or perhaps if it uh, really boasts something, something new that they can distinguish from, let's say, power, power transition theory or so. But in fact, the question, if, it, if somebody who uses a phrase like that, a coinage like that, has grasped any bit of the essence of the Athenian author is out of out of discussion. It's not not really interesting to most of them, and they like the alliteration, simple as simple as that, as simple as that. If it would be the the over trap or whatever, nobody would would care about it. <laughs> TT, that's it, and that's why it works. It's a very clever slogan, after all. Nothing, well, something against it. Yeah, nothing against it in the first place. But um, I think that's it. Perhaps we have to find something with H for Herodotian. Don't know. Herodotian heuristics or whatever. But, uh, but, but Th Thucydides' trap is something that works. And if, it, if it's translated, for example, by uh, uh, Henri Lévy in, in, in French, and it's Le Piège de Thucydide or something like that, it doesn't have the same sound, the same the same amount of authority, Fun, funny enough. <laughs> uh, could, could I just uh, jump in? And one thing that uh, has occurred to me about the whole Thucydides trap uh, discussion, whatever we may say about Allison's interpretation of what Thucydides thought, uh, it would seem also to depend on the idea that Thucydides was right about um, the cause of the war. Uh, I mean, if this is a theory that we can actually apply now, um, we have to take a stand on Thucydides' quality as an actual historian, which is uh, a, a huge, uh, a huge issue. So, uh, this assumption that somehow Thucydides must have been right in analyzing his situation um, seems to be quite prevalent. I, at least that's my impression. I don't know what um, what the panelists would would say about that, but I think we should distinguish 
the question of interpreting Thucydides' text from the judgment that Thucydides was even right. Maybe he was totally wrong about um, you know, the growth of Athenian power was the ultimate cause of, of the war. Maybe it's just incorrect. Um, so anyway, that's just um, one thought that follows, I think, um, fairly naturally on uh, Christian Bent's uh, comment. Can I, can I say something to follow up? Just a, a parallel that strikes me um, is that, that also comes from classics is, the, is Nietzsche's idea of Apollo and Dionysus, which is not backed up with any proof. And people take it as a, it's a catchy idea that's caught on very universally and broadly. And very few people ever ask if Nietzsche was right. Um, turns out he wasn't. <laughs> I'm quite pessimistic about the possibility of scholars to um, to get people to uh, to listen to more complex arguments. I was thinking during Sergio Brilantes, uh, during what he was saying, um, he spoke very subtly and very intelligently about Thucydides, and I don't think that generally people want to hear about um, the complexity of the dialectic of the dualities that are are present. I think I think it's brilliant what he said, but. Uh, generally, people want to hear uh, alliteration, as Christian Bent said. Yeah, very simple tags, yes. uh, <laughs> slogans, and yes. then that works. But if you say, oh, you know, we have to talk about it, and there are two viewpoints, or maybe even more viewpoints, and it becomes exactly. more complex and to follow and to understand, and it takes work. Exactly. <laughs> That's very disappointing, isn't it? <laughs> But I think it's true. Yeah, I wanted also to thank. Oh, sorry. You, you, you. I want to ask a question. How does the social reality? No. Well, Can I you come up to the microphone, Shigo? <laughs> sorry, I'm going to get crusher here. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, how does the social reality of peoples in different places inform the interpretation and adaptation or reception of two cities? For instance, in Africa, in Nigeria, we have different kinds of crises that are, we thought were captured by Thucydides, some of those dialogues. Um, I remember uh, a presentation on the uh, Delian dialogue about the self-destructive nature of democracy itself. And that's exactly what we plunge ourselves into in Nigeria. And so in different places, um, how does Thucydides presaged the reoccurrence of what happened in Greece in his time? There is no easy answer here, I suppose, and someone might follow uh, follow up on that. Um, I suppose this is exactly how uh, how I envisage the more global approach to the cities because we have usually focused on very limited kind of um, sources and very limited um, also geographical and chronological time spans. Um, so I, I, have no, I have no knowledge of uh, the history of Nigeria uh, or many other countries in Africa, unfortunately, but I'm sure that there is there are various uh, takes on uh, on that poly on politics in Africa, and I, I have no idea whether this was done by people in Nigeria or from the outside, like Western commentators on uh, on that. Um, so yeah, but anyway, the uh, it takes it takes again a lot of a lot of uh, effort to to understand that um I'm, I'm not sure i have an answer to your question but it is a very good one thank you can i add a comment here sure yeah i was i was thinking of the phrase secular scripture which i think classic sometimes is in the west and just to underscore in places where it doesn't function and replace religious scripture as easily you could get uh, a very, maybe there is no Thucydides trap <laughs> in Africa or in other places. And that leads to my question, are you planning to 
edit a volume on the global Thucydides to sort of open up and find other maybe dominant interpretations of him or disuse of him. Um, are you planning to do that? <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I'll very briefly answer your question. Thanks. Yes, in some, at some point we, we actually do. Um, we still have to figure out how and in what ways, certainly so engaging people that are more knowledgeable in other fields. And that would be the point of kind of a collective work, uh, collective effort. But maybe uh, Christian had something to add to the previous, no? No, I found this a very interesting intervention um, because it, it, it uh, directly takes us to a massive problem in all uh, reception, uh, possible reception, not only Thucydidean reception. But when we just focus on, on Thucydides, the main problem is that uh, the question of how analogy making works. So why do we think that we are, let's say, comparable enough to uh, the protagonists in, let's say, Thucydides' work in order to make us, uh, let's say, their, their um, successors? So we think the Western, uh, classical Western uh, block thought to be the Athenians or be a kind of, of new kind of Athenians, which is perhaps absolutely silly if you if you think about the um, criteria, the parameters that Thucydides sets for his Athenians, as well as as others who identified themselves in the work. And so this is this is a main problem with the Thucydides trap, but not only with this with this model, but and, and this was something I would I would uh, ask or I would, I, would, I would say when it comes to, for example, Nigerian reception of Thucydides, the question is how you think to uh, create an analogy that is telling enough, that is precise enough in order to make proceedings in the work speak to yourself, speak to you. So why is it possible that you can compare yourself to, let's say, the imperialistic um, option uh, motives of Athens or perhaps the more reluctant uh, politics of, of Sparta in order to uh, find something that it, that is telling you something for your own um, for your own uh, reality which is I think very very problematic because normally we tend to set we brought up in this classical tradition tend to set that there is a possible analogy to make. It is very easy to make an analogy. And this is something that is even more problematic to me sometimes than the easy answers and the, 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 easy, the easy questions and the easy answers uh, that, that, you, that you bring in the, bring on the form. Yes, and uh, if I may add something on that, the, the million dialogue specifically is very is very telling in this kind of various receptions of the series because because it has been read in completely different uh, ways uh, depending on who is reading it and when and, when and, uh, and why. So it can be either a discourse on imperialism, uh, either a discourse on the failures of democracy or uh, on the law of the strongest, uh, on the on, on many different things and it, it's really fascinating how it changes very radically and this was also one of the main uh, main topics of Powell's book uh, Powell's uh, paper that I de dealt with uh, precisely this change in uh, in approaches to the million dialogue after the world war after world war one uh, Luca Please. Uh, yeah, um, I would like just to address a question uh, by uh, Judith Hallett and about uh, uh, Chaplin's image. Um, we didn't suppose that it could be a controversial image. Uh, and um, I think we provided in our talk um, our reasons for using this image so to connect our volume with the uh, Ops Bones. Uh, work uh, and of course to introduce some of the main topics of our text uh, i mean collected uh, um, volume but we are very sorry if yeah. this image have hurt you so please uh, apologize also on behalf of even for this yeah absolutely thank you luca um sergio maybe wants to add something 
yes uh, thank you very much um, I'm, I'm sorry i i was uh, i i just want to rebound on the question of the global uh, uh, reception of uh, of two cds uh, sorry about that uh, and um, since there will be uh, if uh, i rightly understood a follow up to the a very welcome follow up to the to this volume uh, i was wondering if uh, if there is of uh, if you are wondering to um, collect uh, for example, it could be interesting. I, um, I, I suppose to collect all the translations made of Tuesdays in in the world, of course, uh, during the 20th century, because I, I think that will it, it will be something very engaging, uh, an engaging pro uh, project, but uh, as well um, something that could clarify the the spreading of uh, of Tuesdays and. Uh, I think also help us to 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 understand why Tuesdays is still a name that that sound uh, to that that makes sense uh, that mm, to even uh, uh, even to those um, that are not acquainted with uh, with this work and uh, and it will be interested interesting as well uh, to understand the the collection in which the translations have been published uh, because i'm for example i i, I made the, this example of the italian translation by pietro sgroi that was published not for a, um, a university press uh, but for uh, an institute of political studies and uh, i think that even this this kind of uh, of of data could be um, as well um, revealing uh, about the, the the reception to this date. Thank you. Oh yes, ab absolutely. Thanks so much. Yes, we have actually um, started off our conversation a few months ago. Me and Luca, I mean, uh, precisely talking about translations and how one can easily kind of uh, start from there and then go forward. Because after afterwards, we have, I mean. You, you need some kind of basis in the in um, and uh, the translations are very telling in in many instances. I've uh, uh, actually this morning I found out very briefly um, um, that Neville Morley in his uh, in his blog actually a few months ago discussed one little piece of translation of the series in the in Chinese from the 1960 that I mentioned earlier. And uh, there is the use of uh, of words that you don't find in Thucydides, actually, like uh, um, um, that I don't remember now exactly, but that man is not important, but only his labor is important, uh, <laughs> which sounds very weird. And then he found how I mean, what he what the actual translator uh, um, where he took it, and uh, this is from one of Pericles' speeches. And anyway, it's it's uh, it's very fascinating how also. Um, different levels of uh, language knowledge can then um, be shaped by action, by um, ideologies. Um, and I think this is very, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, Luca is here much more uh, of an expert than, than I am, given his work on uh, on the Hobbes translations, translation of Thucydides. So maybe he wants to add something on, on that as well. I think that you have an extremely <laughs> persuasive, so I haven't anything to add <laughs> about this. Yes, and I was also, since I'm uh, talking about translation, I was also wondering. I, we this is just a kind of discussion we had, but nothing, nothing serious for, for at, at the moment. Um, but in many countries, I suppose, like in in Africa, uh, in South Africa. I'm pretty sure that I mean some of the English translations have been used in schools, or also in uh, in uh, many so, so, uh, those schools where Greek is taught as well. Um, but in many African countries, they must have used like French translation, I suppose. But I have no idea. I would like to yeah explore that as well. Uh, and anyway, I think that that the most challenging aspect is try to uh, connect uh, the history of classical scholarship in that. Uh, in that countries and especially even the education uh, provide the classic education provided and then the translation so try to discuss all together these three different layers 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Federico, please. Oh, uh, thanks very much. Um, I, I was um, I was reluctant to raise my hand because there are a couple of, of questions in the Q and A, uh, uh, but but um, I, I I I ought I should um, I should raise the hand my hand first of all really to record um, while while we are all here um, my gratitude and indeed Lorenzo's gratitude to uh, Ivan and Luca for well for putting this together and indeed for choosing uh, our supplementary volume uh, series as as its uh, as its home. Um, it's been great fun uh, working together. Um, and of course, yes, I mean, th th these occasions are, you know, first and foremost, as for celebrations of, of, of a book and indeed a job well done. But it seems to me that as a result of this discussion, you, uh, and even a look, are already sort of being put to, to work. I mean, you've been, you've been given another big task to, to pursue. But I suppose you could take that as a, as a measure of, of, you know, of the success of this of this endeavor. Uh, and of course, yes, I mean, global facilities. I mean, I was thinking, for example, you know, is what about the reception of facilities in India or indeed in Pakistan? Wouldn't that be worth looking very hard into? But um, anyway, that, that's no doubt for, uh, for, another, for another day. But um, it seems to me that actually the um, project that we are sort of saluting and celebrating today, as well as the one that you know, has been sort of tentatively mooted this afternoon, um, take us really to, I suppose, two of the um, uh, ambitions that Lorenzo Calvelli and I had when we, we thought we'd try and put together a, a journal called History of Classical Scholarship. Uh, the first one being um, looking at classical scholarship as something that, of course, yes, is done by university professors and university teachers, but it's not exclusively done by university professors and teachers. Um, and that is at the same time, something somewhat different from you know, straightforward classical reception. And there are all sorts of ways in which you know, non-academics have been producing notable insights into classical topics. And it seems to me that your book presents us with a, with a wonderful set of, 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 of important case studies, whilst at the same time, I suppose, um, getting us really to, to, to explore the, the, the boundaries of classical scholarship. I mean, Rachel Bolzoni was talking about siloing, right, and, 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 all, and all its perils, and it seems to me that uh, Thucydides gives us a, an extremely valuable um, uh, viewpoint. And of course, a second ambition that, that, that we've been sort of nurturing from the start of the sort of HCS, uh, History of Classical Scholarship project, is indeed to try and look at uh, or for classical scholarship that is not necessarily produced in uh, what we call, in a very imperfect term, in my view, the West, uh, or indeed that is not necessarily produced in the, I don't know, five um, you know, academic languages that most classics journals would, uh, at least in Europe, um, would accept or welcome um, contributions in. And again, it seems to me that um, some aspects of, 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 of your project, the project we're discussing today, but also the, the Global Facilities Project, would um, uh, take us in, uh, in that direction. And that, I suppose, wouldn't just be you know, good news for his sort of classical scholarship. It would be good news, I think, for all of us. It would really get us to, to think harder about um, the history and indeed the shape of our, of our subject. So yeah, thank you very much. Oh, I think that um, that brings us, unfortunately, to the uh, conclusion of our of our time uh, for this uh, discussion. I, I'm just struck by the reflection that uh, in doing this kind of research, um, you catalog and and analyze so many different types of of interpretations of of Thucydides. There's so many different examples of of interpretation. Um, it's it's interesting to reflect on what perhaps the distinction is between the use of Thucydides and the abuse of Thucydides uh, that um, could be um, could be extracted from all of these different interpretations. I'd be interested to hear your reflections on on that uh, dividing line because presumably there is one. But um, I think that, um, however, because of the pressure of time, we should we should draw this uh, session to uh, to a close. Uh, thanking um, all of the panelists. Thank you very much for for joining us, and thank you, um, Ivan. Uh,
Thank you, Luca. Uh, thank you very much for the volume. And um, with that, um, that's the conclusion of our session.